Hello and welcome to this video, which is part one of a two-part series on building a simple flow in Apache NiFi. In this part, we'll talk about how to add and configure processors. And in part two, we'll talk about connecting the processors and running them. We're just gonna build a simple two processor flow. To add a processor to the canvas, simply go up to the components toolbar and drag and drop a processor component. This opens an add processor window. Here you can scroll through the processors that are listed to find the one you want. Or you can click on it, the tags in the tag cloud to reduce the list by category and functionality that you're looking for. For any processor you might be interested in, you can click on it to see a short description of what it does below. The processors that have a shield icon next to them can be restricted by your system administrator. And if you hover over this shield, it'll tell you what kind of an access a person would have if they are given access to that processor. You can read more about multi-tenant authorization in the user guide. We're not going to use any of these processors, so we'll unselect these tags. And as you get used to using NiFi, you'll find that you'll know the processor you want and you can just go type the name in the filter bar here. We're going to type in generate flow file and select that here. And then we can click add down below. The generate flow file processor we'll use to create test files in our flow. Now let me demonstrate adding a processor again for our other processor. We'll just drag and drop it to the canvas and type in this time log attribute. And we can just double click it actually to add it to the canvas. Now we can see that both of these processors have little warning icons next to the name. And that means that these processors are invalid. And if we hover over the icon, it'll tell us the minimum requirements that we need to configure in order to make the processors valid and able to run. So um, we can actually see that up in the status bar, it shows us that we have two invalid processors on our canvas. To learn more about a processor, you can right click on it and select the usage option. And that will take you to the documentation for the processor and help you understand the different properties that it has and what needs to be configured. Um, you can also right click on it to configure it. So we'll go ahead and do that. Select the configure option. And this opens up the configure processor window, which has several tabs across the top, settings, scheduling, properties, and comments. On the comments tab, you can just type any comments you may have, whether they be notes to yourself or maybe to your team members about why you configured the processor the way you did or something like that. The Properties tab is the main place you're going to go to configure information that the processor needs to run properly. Some properties are listed in bold. This means they're required and they must have a value in order for the processor to be valid. The properties that are not in bold, like the custom text property here, are optional and can be left blank. Anywhere that you see the question mark icon, you can hover over it to get more information about that item. For properties, this will tell you what the property is looking for, what default value it has if it has one, and whether it supports the expression language. In this case, we're gonna change the file size from zero bytes to one kilobyte. Note that you have to include the unit of measure here. We can go ahead and click apply, and then I'll go back and show you another feature that you have when you hover over the question mark. Now we can actually see a history for that property value. So it'll tell me that it was changed to one kilobyte and the date and time it was changed. And we can still see the default value if we want to set it back to that. Going over to the scheduling tab, we can see that here we tell the processor things like how to know when to run, how often to run, and how to long, long to run each time it runs. The scheduling strategy tells the processor when to run based on one of three possible strategies. It depends on what the processor has available to it. This processor has timer-driven and cron-driven strategies available to it. Timer-driven means to run on a simple interval, and cron-driven allows it to run at a very specific time, such as the third Tuesday of the second month of a specific year at a specific time. For both of these, you'd set the specific interval or time in the run schedule. 
We're going to leave it at the default timer driven and set the run schedule to every one second. A third scheduling strategy is event driven and it's only available for certain processors. It means the processor will run in the event that a flow file enters a connection that feeds the processor. When this strategy is selected, the run schedule option is not configurable. See the user guide for more information about that strategy. Concurrent tasks controls how many tasks or flow files the processor works on at the same time. Increasing the value will allow the processor to handle more data at the same time, but it'll also use more system resources to do so. We're going to leave it at the default, which is one concurrent task at a time. Run duration controls how long the processor should run each time it kicks off. Each time a processor completes a process, it must update the repository in order to transfer flow files to the next connection. Lower latency means it'll be a shorter period of time, but it'll update the repository more often and transfer the data to the next processor faster, but this is more expensive and only so much data is getting processed each time. Higher throughput will be a longer period of time. The processor will work on more data before updating the repository and it'll transfer more data, but it'll take longer. So it's just a matter of finding the balance that you want for your particular situation. Going over to the settings tab, you can see that there's a place to change the name of the processor. By default, the name is going to be the type of processor it is, but you could have multiple instances of the same processor type on your canvas. So this way you can customize what the processor is named for any given instance. We can change the name of this one to create test files. Below the name is the processor's ID number. Each processor has a unique ID number, which is another way that you can distinguish one processor from another in the logs when you're trying to troubleshoot. Below the ID number is the type of processor. This is handy if you've changed the name of the processor and you want to be able to look back and see what type of processor it was. Below that are the penalty duration and yield duration. Penalty duration has to do with how long the processor should penalize a flow file if it doesn't process it successfully. And yield duration tells the processor how long to yield if it can't run the way it needs to. Below the penalty duration is the bulletin level. The bulletin level is the level at which the processor will produce bulletins, which are like logging statements that will appear as an icon in the face of the processor. By default, it's set to warning, which means you'll only see bulletins when there are warnings or errors in the logs for that processor. And that's probably the setting you'll want to leave it at in most cases. That's what we'll leave this one set to. Up at the top is automatically terminate relationships. So first of all, what do we mean by relationship? A relationship is the destination route that a flow file should follow depending on the outcome of its processing. So for example, several processors have both a success and a failure relationship, indicating which route the flow file should take if it, the processing was successful or if it failed. This processor only has a success relationship. In this case, we're not gonna terminate flow files on that relationship because we want them to continue to the next processor in the flow. We'll go ahead and click apply to finish configuring this processor. Now we'll configure the log attribute processor. Again, we right click on it and select configure. On the settings tab, we're gonna change a couple things we didn't change on the generate flow file processor. We're gonna change the bulletin level to info. This way it'll produce bulletins whenever it runs and logs attributes for the flow files and we'll be able to see that on the face of the processor. For automatically terminate relationships, we're gonna go ahead and terminate flow files on the success relationship because after it has logged all the attributes for the flow files, we don't need them anymore and we can get rid of them. On the properties tab, we're gonna leave the default settings as they are and we're just gonna click apply. Now we can see that both processors are actually still invalid and this is because we haven't connected them yet. We'll go over connecting processors and running them in the next of this two part series on building a simple flow. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next video.